John, you're our first one on. Oh, here we go. Now we got people coming on. All right, nice, nice. All right, you guys, we're gonna give everybody just a couple more, uh, more minutes to jump on here. Uh, make sure we get as many people on as possible, but we're gonna start probably in the next two minutes, start right on time and get rolling right into this. Uh, Robert, I see you on here already, awesome. Okay, good. Uh, everybody else, go ahead and keep your mics muted uh, through this thing. Um, again, if we get to questions and that sort of thing, you guys can always type them into the, uh, the chat box. Um, or if we want to toward the end, uh, if you guys want to unmute and uh, come on one at a time to ask questions, we can see about getting into that as well. So um, again, let's give everybody about one more minute here to jump on and then we'll be uh, ready to rock and roll. Uh, and if you guys, if I break out into some like uh, a coughing fit, I, I apologize. I got that damn uh, zombie flu that's going around. That shit sucks. I'm on like, <laughs> I'm on what, week and a half into it? Holy shit. Yeah. I think put me in my ass. Um, it's been uh, rough this year. Oh, man. I usually don't get sick, but Jesus. This one, I was like, I was like bedridden for like three days after this shit. It's horrible. Uh, all right, you guys, it is, it's four o'clock my time. So it's time to roll. So Sergeant Nick Ryan's here. I appreciate you guys joining us uh, for today. Um, we're going to be talking about tactical medical today. Uh, this is something I have wanted to cover uh, ever since the, the mass shooting in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, with the, with the shit that went down in Florida, uh, I was like, you know what, I, I need to, to stop being busy and make this happen. All right. So uh, today we're going to be covering, uh, you know, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, we're going to be covering um, the number one preventable cause of traumatic death, uh, medical issues uh, versus traumatic injuries, uh, first aid or, or, or uh, gunshot first aid versus, you know, standard first aid and a ton, a ton more stuff. Um, and again, the reason that we're doing this is we want to do our best to educate the public and what they can do um, to save lives, okay? Because not, not always are we going to be, you know, arm, armed badasses that go out there and, and can take down the bad guy. A lot of times we may not, uh, the best way we can help is by, is, by doing, is by handling the medical side of things and helping people survive uh, after, you know, a mass shooting or after, uh, you know, a family member uh, gets injured or, you know, you could be on the range and someone accidentally gets shot. Okay. I've been there, done that. Yeah. I'm lucky that I had at least uh, enough medical training that I was able to handle that situation uh, and be able to take care of, uh, of a guy that actually he shot himself in the leg while on my range. Okay. So um, that's the stuff that we're going to be covering. And since myself, I have some background in, in tactical medical, um, I don't have the type of knowledge that the uh, newest Ghost Ring Tactical staff member has. Um, so let me introduce you to Robert Militello. So Robert, thank you, thank you for being with us. Thank you for bringing me on. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, this topic, you know, Nick's talking about just since the Las Vegas shooting. And I got to say that this is one of those things that has been um, in my wheelhouse, just because of my profession, uh, all the way since 1993, when the uh, when triple T triple C was basically born out of Somalia, uh, the lessons we learned on the ground in uh, in Africa taught us what our military medics need to, need to do. Uh, my name is Robert Militello. I've been a paramedic for 22 years now. Uh, that's on the civilian side, and I've worked in just about every aspect on the civilian side. Although I was in the military for many years, 16 years. Uh, and served as a combat flight medic in both Iraq and Afghanistan theaters, uh, transporting hundreds and hundreds of significantly wounded uh, uh, soldiers in and out. Uh, the lessons that we learned in, in combat is what's, it's what's being played out now in civilian medicine. So it's become a huge uh, transition between what civilians do in the field versus what the military did, and we've learned from it. 
Uh, I can tell you, I'm going to talk extensively about the tourniquet because um, my time, I'm sorry, go back a little bit. Uh, when I got out of the Army uh, in 2005, I went on with uh, Blackwater. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, uh, but I spent about, uh, well, seven years, seven contracts in different uh, different areas of the world, including Iraq and Afghanistan and then Israel. Uh, one of the contracts, I was on a uh, mentoring a program, uh, a military advisor program with the Afghans. And under that program, I was the one that was wounded. And I'll be honest with you guys, lack of a better term, I'm, I'm a shit magnet. So I was blown up in Iraq. Uh, I was uh, shot in Afghanistan and I was stabbed in a uh, unnamed Central American country. So uh, throughout my travels, I've been the one on the receiving end. And as the medic, it's one of those things where you really have to, A, talk about mindset, because where you're at when you get injured if it is an active hostile threat, and then training the guys around you. I'm the medic, I have all the pathophysiology and, and, and all of that high speed stuff when it comes to the science behind it, but I needed my guys and my team to be able to control my bleeding, to, to deal with my issues. Um, now with the geopolitical situation we have going on, uh, you, don't, you could be in the mall with your wife and kids and, and this, uh, this kind of threat's gonna present itself and uh, what do you do in the aftermath? What do you do uh, right after it happens? I can tell you right now, civilian EMS is morphing right now and it's moving slower than it should. Uh, paramedics on the civilian side, your fire guys and, and what you have in your town are specifically told by their chiefs not to enter a hot zone while there's an active shooter going on. Uh, that is being changed. I mean, we saw in Columbine that you know these kids were laying bleeding out inside columbine while a swat team clears a huge building well if you know anything about cqb it's going to take forever to go through that methodically and make sure that that building's clear uh what happened is people were dying as a result of it and ems your paramedics and emts were on standby on the outside and couldn't go in so what we've learned now is we've kind of morphed into a thing called rescue task force and what they're doing is, is they're taking specially trained paramedics putting them in body armor and and helmets and they're sending them in with police officers to provide them cover. Still controversial. Uh, a lot of fire chiefs will not arm their medics. So it's one of those things where it gets into the, the, the fire chiefs and the police chiefs. Uh, but that's just a little bit of background on myself. I've been, I, have, I own a company called Tactical Medical Concepts, and I've been teaching this stuff uh, across the country and across the world, working with the Chicago Fire Department and pretty much fire departments all over the, uh, the, the Midwest. Uh, Nick and I have, uh, have come to an arrangement and I think it's an excellent fit. I can't wait for the next training, uh, with ghost ring and to get involved with you guys. Uh, Nick, before we go on, you want me to uh, stop and say anything? Uh, no, you know, you went into, you know, again, I want you to make sure you covered your, your badassery and make sure that you, <laughs> you, you covered everything and all the, all the, all the shit storms you've been in. Uh, <laughs> so people understand that it's like, you know what the hell you're talking about. Okay. When we get into this. Yeah, I've been around the block. There's a lot of people teaching this, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, as the, the medicine is morphing, nobody's really truly reinventing the wheel. Uh, there are certain things that we have to do, and they have to be done in a certain way. Uh, I have a lot of people out there that are teaching combat medicine that have never spent a day in combat. And I always ask them, well, you know, it's, it's always theory at this point until you actually apply it. It's like gunfighting. If you've never been in a gunfight, it's theory until you actually apply it, and then you see what works and doesn't work. Isn't it Mike Tyson that said that everyone's got a plan till they get punched in the face? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So we see how it goes. Uh, any, uh, any questions so far? Uh, I don't think we've got any so far. I don't even have the chat box up, so I wouldn't even be able to see. So um, let's, get to the, the, let's get to the first question. Uh, okay. So first question I got for you is, uh, what's the number one preventable cause of uh, traumatic death? The number one, easily, hands down, the number one preventable cause of traumatic death is, is hemorrhage. Okay. Uh, 2,500 men would have come back from Vietnam and not be on that wall in D.C. if we would have had something as simple as a combat action tourniquet. This piece of nylon and Velcro, uh, a little bit of plastic, makes all the difference in the world. And in my particular case, I'm very fond of this piece of kit. There are several commercial tourniquets out there, but this is the one that saved my life because my wound was in my dominant arm and it disrupted uh, a major blood vessel. And knowing what I know about physiology and bleeding out, I know how much time I have when that happens. Uh, Self-deployment of an item like this is huge. So uh, one of the things that we do in the training classes is teach you how to self-deploy it one hand, especially with your, with your non-dominant hand. And if you can do that, then anytime you deploy it is gonna, is gonna be easy, easy to do. 
Um, so yeah, the number one cause is, is hemorrhage. Extremity hemorrhage is the easiest control because we have something like the combat action tourniquet. Uh, there are other areas of wound packing, necks and groins, places you can't get uh, a tourniquet to. Yep. Uh, as much as you... As much as you may dislike your buddy and your team, you can't put a tourniquet on his neck. You know, so, so it's one of those, <laughs> it's one of those no goes at that particular station. Uh, but having something that you can stop the bleeding. So the combat action tourniquet is one of those things that we teach extensively in in most of the classes. And when you and I work together and we do this, we're going to do the the kind of the walk, crawl, run thing. And by the time they're running, they're going to be doing it under extensive stress with some pyrotechnics going off, maybe some live gunfire going off to create that environment. Uh, the first thing I'll say about all of this medicine is that if you are in an actual hostile threat, whether it be combat, active shooter, somebody in your house at three o'clock in the morning, no medicine until the gunfight is won. You do not come out of the fight until the, until the fight is won. Uh, we have found that more casualties exist because if I've got a 12-man squad and I take two rifles out of the fight to carry a guy and another rifle from the medic or the corpsman, then I've gone ahead and taken, you know, 30% of my, my fighting element to deal with one wounded guy. So the concept, and I know we're going to be getting into triple C or yep. T triple C is self aid, buddy aid, and then moving on to the medics. So that it's a simple concept on that. And that kind of segues into the next question, I guess, about what is tactical but combat. Before we get into that, I want to make sure that people understand. It's like, you guys should carry those, you know, the, the, the combat tourniquets with you. Um, I've got one in my truck. I've got one in almost every set of, of gear that I have. Um, I have uh, a tourniquet on me. Uh, again, just in case, you never know when you're going to need it. Uh, they don't cost that much money uh, to be able to have, you know, five, six of these things uh, in your vehicles, uh, in your house, and just and just ready to be able to deploy that th those items. So right, and this is the one item that I would recommend everybody yeah. take out of when it comes packaged in the plastic. First thing you do is rip that plastic away and preload this. So in the course, what we talk about is, is preloading this for self-deployment. So you can get it ready to move and, uh, and get it on you quickly. Uh, I know in my particular case, it took me about 28 seconds. I mean, I was in a fight, so it took me about 28 seconds to, to get my tourniquet off my body armor, apply it to my arm, and shut that bleed down. So in that time period, I lost probably about a liter of blood. You know, we're thinking about what my, my BDUs had on them or my, my form of plan had on it. Uh, it was pretty well saturated. So you figure a liter. And if you have five liters in your body and you have already lost one, we start getting into those areas of decompensated shock. And that's where it turns into a significant thing. Gotcha. All right, great. So let's move on to that next question we we're talking about. So, so what is this? What is this TCCC? TCCC is something that morphed out of the out of the military and it got pushed on to every medic out there prior to to going into Afghanistan or going into uh, Iraq. Uh, what happened was is that back in the, the 1980s and 1990s, we were training our medics like civilian paramedics. So the ranger medics would end up going to a civilian school or some uh, some version of that and being trained as a civilian medic. Well, if I'm on the side of the highway and I've got plenty of time and I don't have any sustained fire and, and I've got all these great, wonderful things going, then I can go ahead and, and slowly backboard and see collar somebody and, and do spinal immobilization and all that. And what we learned is when we learned it in Somalia, unfortunately on the Black Hawk Down incident, that our medics need to move at a different pace. They need to move differently than the civilian counterparts. So TCCC was morphed out of that. And again, it goes back into controlling the hemorrhaging, controlling that bleeding, uh, keeping the airway open. That means the, the air moving in and out of the lungs and dealing with, with some type of thoracic chest injury, whether it be an open chest, open uh, sucking chest wound, which would be an open pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax, which is a, a significant life threat. So TCCC was born out of that. And then we started implementing it all throughout uh, all the combat theaters with great success. I can tell some fantastic stories about, uh, about some of the successes we've had with implementation. All right, cool. Um, next question we got for you is, uh, talk to us about the, the difference between uh, medical issues uh, and uh, traumatic injury. Yeah, it's funny because people always talk about their CPR class and their AED class and their first aid class. And, and in a lot of cases, well, the first aid, not so much, but the CPR and AED are medical related issues. Uh, these would be things like heart attacks and strokes, 
things that are internal in our body that happens because of the disease process. Your cold right now is a medical issue. It's one of those things that's happening to you. It sucks. You got that achy, hung from a meat hook, beaten feeling. That goes, that goes aside with that. And that's a medical issue. Trauma, the best way to identify trauma is kinetic energy, a transfer of kinetic energy. I hit you with a baseball bat. I stab you with a knife. I shoot you with a gun. So all of these things transfer some type of energy. And in this case, it's kinetic. We get into burns, we start talking about thermal energy. Uh, so traumatic injuries are these. Now you always see the TV shows where, where uh, you know, they're yelling stat and trauma and they're all running around crazy and everything. Well, that's true. This is, this is one of those time sensitive things. But I can tell you as a pre-hospital medical provider that there's not a lot we can do. We can, we can stabilize only to a certain point, and then we have got to get them to that trauma surgeons. The trauma surgeons are the end-all, be-all. Crack your chest, open you up, cross-clamp those major vessels, those major arteries, and, and, and add you know, real blood products and stuff like that. That's the definitive care. So in EMS, we talk about the platinum 10 minutes, which is the first 10 minutes of any trauma-related call, up to the golden hour. The idea is to have you to that surgeon within that hour. Now, depending on where you're at, if you're out in the middle of nowhere hunting, if, uh, you know, these areas, you know, you get into some remote areas, that hour may, may definitely get extended. Uh, so it's one of those things that you're thinking you're on a clock when it comes to, uh, to trauma. So it's just gotcha. kinetic energy. Got it. Got it. Um, so next thing I got for you is uh, the difference, the, the verses between uh, a gunshot wound first aid uh, versus a standard first aid or, uh, you know, CPR. Well, I kind of covers, you know, I kind of hit that already. Yeah. So we'll just touch on a little bit. Uh, you know, you take people say, well, no, I've, I don't need a gunshot wound first aid class because I've taken a standard first aid class. Yeah. And I would tell that, no, this is, this is very different from that. This is immediate <laughs> trauma. Whereas, you know, you're dealing with a burn or you're dealing with, you know, grandma has a stroke or something along those lines where, where these are still important and these are still life threats. But if you're out in the range, somebody NDs into their thigh and, you know, it's a friend of yours and something like that. And now they've got that, that bright red pumper coming out and, uh, and they're dumping all that red stuff on the ground. That's where that immediate action has to take place. Yep. I, I've been there, been there. So <laughs> I know what you mean. The old ND. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so moving on from there, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, ballistic wounding and, and what we've seen in, in Hollywood compared to what it's, re- what it's like in real life. Well, we all know that Hollywood blows stuff out of proportion. If you've ever seen a John Woo movie, you know that uh, you know, <laughs> guys are going to get hit with a 9 millimeter round and fly 10 feet through the air, and we just know that's not going to happen. Uh, ballistic wounding is a science. It truly is, and there's some really, really smart guys out there that have done a lot of research in this. You know, the big argument on, uh, for shooters is shot placement versus large caliber. You know, if I ever want to start a fight in a, in a chat room or something like that, or on Facebook, all I have to do is throw that piece of raw meat in and watch the dogs go to town. It's kind of amusing. Uh, I would make an argument from a medical side of the house that both are important. You know, if I hit you with something big and fast in a, in a, in a vital organ, it's going to be devastating. So, so they're, all, they're all good. So there's really no winner to that argument. And, and I'll probably get some, some controversy on that because these people get very entrenched in that position, you know, shot placement versus... Uh, versus high, high, uh, high energy. But if you think about it, look at a, a 5.56, five, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about a relatively small projectile, right? Yep. Uh, moving at just under 3,000 feet per second. Well, ballistic wounding is based on mass times velocity. So if I don't have the mass, but I've got the heat coming on, I'm going to create a hell of a temporary channel somewhere in the area of 17 inches with, with tissue disruption. And you can see that in the gelatin. Uh, Hollywood, you know, they just go crazy with stuff. You know, there's, there's, uh, you know, you got 57 gallons of blood and it pumps everywhere. And, and the wounding is not like that. I mean, I've had cases where there was been gang members that have been shot with small caliber, uh, bullet or small caliber weapons, 25s and 22s. These were, these were life ending events. And I was unable to locate the, uh, the gunshot wound. In one case, we, we cut the clothes off of a 19 year old kid who was shot with a 25 right under his armpit. And it went in, it it transected his aorta. And we knew that he was, I mean, he was dead for all intents and purposes, but we couldn't find the hole. There was no bleeding. There was no sign of it. And we stripped this kid down to, down to nothing. And then I saw a little mole underneath his armpit on the side of his ribs and realized that was the entrance wound of a 25 caliber bullet that went in and cut through his aorta, his big pipe in there and dumped all that stuff into his chest cavity. 
Wow. So it may not be as obvious uh, as we as we think it's going to be. You know? Wow, that's incredible. Um, so that you know that brings up another question: is you know uh, how fast uh, you know can someone bleed out? Oh, at 30 seconds, we're talking about about one liter. We start getting in, and now you've got five liters of blood in your body. So the next time you're at uh, Walmart or at the grocery store and you see those two liter uh, bottles of, of soda on the thing, just think you have the average man, the average adult male has about five liters. Now, size dependent, we can go smaller in some cases and then larger in others. You know, if you're a huge guy, you may have you know, more than that. Uh, each one of us is a little bit different, but about five liters. If I, if I hit a major vessel, like, a, uh, like my femoral, like in the Black Hawk Down incident, or my brachials up in my arms, and in that particular kid I was talking about's case where it went in and hit his aorta, which is the biggest, the biggest pipe you got there, uh, bleed times are going to be quick. About 30 seconds for a liter, you figure about a, about a minute and a half for two. Uh, and it got, of course, this all depends on your cardiovascular training. One of the things that the military definitely promotes is being you know, more, more cardiovascular fit. But uh, you get into the area of three liters, and you've lost three liters of blood, we get into something we call decompensating shock. And once you get into that, uh, there's a very good chance that even if we get you to, to that definitive care, uh, that you are just not going to survive. Uh, greater than three liters, I think we're talking about a 94% fatality rate, uh, even if you get them, again, to that exact place. So shutting that bleeding down, and, uh, and uh, getting them to the definitive facility is, is definitely a good immediate action plan. Okay, good. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit. And, and uh, a, a big question a lot of people usually have is, you know, especially when we talk about like CCWs uh, and uh, the legal aspect of everything, you know? So even if we're trying to help someone, you know, what's, 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 our, what's the legal side of things when it comes to us as civilians uh, going in and trying to help people out? Yeah, you know, the, it's, it's an important question, and everybody always asks us when they're taking, well, can I be sued? Well, let's face it, in the United States of America, you can be sued for anything. You can give somebody hot coffee and they spill it in their lap, and you can catch a, a lawsuit on it. I mean, so there's no rhyme or reason to who can and can't be sued. Yeah. Uh, every state that I'm aware of has some version of a good Samaritan law. Now, these laws vary from state to state, and what they is, you act to the level of training that you've received. And you act with the stand. We act within the standard of care, which means you don't do anything crazy. You don't. I saw a guy in a movie take a pen and shove it in a guy's neck. No, you never do any of that because it's outside of your scope, and it would put you at the liability ends that that you wouldn't be able to defend. However, hemorrhage control, stopping the bleeding, and uh, and uh, keeping an airway open. These are all things that that we can learn as lay rescuers, as the non-professional rescuer and make a, make a tremendous difference in somebody's life. So again, individual states have different rules. I mean, some states I've, I've read that say that if, you're, if you shoot the intruder or the perpetrator or the bad guy, that you may not be covered under a good Samaritan law because you caused the wound. So even though you had a legit shoot, you, know, you, you had a legit cause for justifiable use of deadly force, and, and you engage this person, and then you render care, they could hold you civilly liable. Um, that would be a very, you know, you can never tell what a jury is going to do. I mean, the, the, some juries are, are amazing at their verdicts, but I mean, if you're trying to render care, rendering care is one of those things that, that should get you some, some, uh, you know, good points on it. You know, it's not gotcha. trying to help out. Uh, so again, legal aspects of it, good Samaritan laws usually apply to these things. And again, state by state, it, it varies across the board. So I recommend everybody gets to know what, what their state says. Uh, one of the companies that I'm currently doing some instruction for, uh, U.S. Law Shield, uh, they're out of Texas now, but they're doing a huge thing on, on covering people uh, if you take a version of their class. So there's some, some legal uh, coverage that is incorporated into your CCW protection. Nice. So, Very nice. Uh, just a, a plug for them. But they're the only ones I know that are doing that, you know, yeah. they're adding that in there because they're offering a gun course. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, what we should have basically in our, in our, our, our kit, you know, our blowout kit for, uh, that we should keep with us. What should we have with us? All right, great question. You know, the blowout kit is one of those things. It's a great term for it, and everybody should have one. You brought up a, a great point a minute ago when you said that you have to have it on you. Yeah. So things like, like having a tourniquet and throwing it, that's what those cargo pockets are made for on your pants. 
uh, throw a tourniquet in there, throw an Israeli pressure dressing in there. If you're, if you're not into the Israeli dressing, North American Rescue has a fantastic product, uh, some type of pressure dressing. These are little items that you can put in there. I mean, you mentioned the combat action tourniquet, and I brought this guy up. Yep. I mean, once we get this thing folded up and we get it uh, placed in it, it's going to be relatively small. I mean, we're talking about something in the area of about this big. So, so having that item, you know, just in itself is something that's going to, to be able to give you the ability to stop that, that hemorrhage control. One of the questions we have so far with, with the, uh, with the tourniquet wise, uh, someone was asking about, uh, which tourniquet do you recommend and where to buy it from? Well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the cat. I mean, it's like, it's like guns and it's like holsters and it's like all the stuff that we buy I can find just about pros and cons in, in most equipment out there. Uh, I will say that the cat, the combat action tourniquet, this particular one, uh, is sells retail uh, on Amazon for about $26, $27, uh, depending on where you get it. I'd be gotcha. a le little weird, leery of any of the Chinese uh, knockoffs just because, you know, you, if they fail, who knows what's up. Okay. Um, I, this is the tourniquet that, uh, that, that you know, saved my life, so I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, the one thing I would like to Good see the, the cat folks do is change this windlass to uh, change this windlass to a uh, to a aircraft aluminum one, and I've seen a couple of competitors with the exact same uh, concept. Uh, okay. The only thing I found with the with the polymer is that in some of the uh, higher altitudes in Afghanistan, when it's really cold out and people get a little amped up because they're either hit or their buddies hit, yeah. uh, they put a, they crank down on this a little bit. They may actually snap it, and it's only in in really cold temperatures where that polymer gets a little bit more brittle. Okay. Um, other than that, I, I personally love it. There's other products out there. I hate to say this, guys, but, but I find myself to be a little bit of a one-dimensional thinker when it comes to this stuff. If it works, I, I don't try to fix it. So I've had no need, and I've, I carry multiple tourniquets uh, just because of my profession, but I've never had to place more than one tourniquet uh, on, yeah. on a patient. And, and I'll tell you that if it doesn't work uh, to place a second tourniquet, and, and that is the truth. We never release these. But right. with this particular item, if you do it decisively, and, and it's going to hurt if the patient's conscious, you know, if, you're, if your buddy's conscious, they're going to be upset about it because this thing, in some cases, hurts worse than the gunshot wound that they received. Okay. So it's one of those things where uh, you got to put it on, you got to put it on decisive and, and be a little bit aggressive with your approach to it. Um, could, you, could you show everybody uh, the basics of, of how to apply one? Sure. Uh, for the preload, um, here, let me get set up a little bit. Yeah. For the preload on it, uh, one of the things I talk about is first we talk a little bit about the items on here so we know what we're talking about. Okay. And uh, this is one of the first things I do in the class. The buckle, the new buckles on these uh, have only one slot. The older models, and you may run into an older model, will have a double slot. Uh, go through the first one, but I just identify this as the buckle. And when I bring the, the other end up and show you. So the first thing I do is when I get a tourniquet and I'm setting it up for to take out, I will go ahead and take this item and rip the plastic off. Uh, it comes with instructions. You can look at them. I mean, it, it never hurts to look at them, but we're guys, so you know, we very rarely look at it unless we. Uh, we uh, I'm assuming I'm, I'm not assuming everyone's a guy, but. <laughs> yeah, I think you're good. I think you're good to say. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, we get into uh, uh, the windlass. The windlass gives you the mechanical advantage, and that's the stick right here. That's the polymer piece I was talking about. Uh, without a windlass, it's really not a tourniquet. Uh, you know, you go into the doctors and they put a constricting band on when, before they take your blood and things like that. I would consider that to be a vein. You can call that a venous tourniquet, not an arterial one, but I would actually just call it a constricting band. And I put this on somebody anytime I start an IV or do any blood draw work or anything like that. And that's just to get the vessels to pump up so I can get a good target. Uh, as we come down, we've got this little uh, white piece of Velcro right here. But if you can't see, there's a, there's a little plastic C in there, a little C clamp in there. This, when you tighten the windlass down, is where your where your uh, end is going to lock in, so it doesn't unravel. Uh, back up to the windlass real quick. What gives this 360 degree coverage is there is a nylon ribbon that that is connected to the to the windlass, uh, and it runs down the center of the rest of the tourniquet. So it runs the inside. So when you apply pressure with the windlass, you get a 360 degree band on this. And I can guarantee you, if this is applied correctly, about three turns, and the person on the receiving end is going to be yelping. This thing grabs and tightens in a 360 pattern. Like, you know, the first time students do it, it's actually funny because I say, okay, go ahead and put it on. 
and they put it on, they start tightening it up and they get to about that two and a half turn and they're like, ow, ow, ow. And I'm like, yeah, that thing yeah. bites on you. Yep. Um, this little piece right here, it says time on it. Uh, this is something that once we get done, we're going to cover that. So it won't, we're going to cover the windlass inside the sea so it can't come out. And then this would be a, the appropriate place to write the time of the application of the tourniquet. As we come down, now we just have nylon, 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 until we get to the very end. And if you see that piece of that red, that red tip there, yep. that red tip becomes important. Uh, when you're preloading, and what I'm going to do in a second, you, we always have to think red towards the heart. So now if I get this in position and I want to preload it, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten it out. What I'm doing now is that ribbon on the inside, I'm just pulling it down and getting it all straight because it's inside of there. At this point, I would go ahead and put this white tape on the outside, just like that, so it's not blocking the opening. Okay. I would take the windlass and put it inside the seat, and then I would flip this around, and I would run it through the red end, through there, and come down about four inches. And this particular tourniquet, because it's a trainer, it says training on there, and it gives me that four-inch that four inch area kind of automatically. Okay. So, so now I'm here, right? I've got this right there. Now all I want to do is Z it up. Just take it like this, put it there, put it there, there, and there, and that makes up my tourniquet. Okay. Now if I put that someplace on my body and I had to deploy it, I would grab it out with that non-dominant hand. I would shake it to pop it free. Remember red towards the heart. So I'm going to turn that around so it's going towards my heart, yep. and then I would slip the tourniquet on. Once I get it that in position, I can go ahead and tighten it. The tighter I do it here, the less I'm going to have to tighten the windlass. So as I pull it down and get the tourniquet in place, the Velcro is now locked in. At this point, I can now free up and start taking my turns. And that's one. You do three turns, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go with two today. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. But once I've got that in place, I'll go ahead and clip it into the C. So it's inside there locked in. Now I'll do a little housekeeping. I'll take the, uh, the opposite end and I'll bring it up there and then I'll cover it up and now my tourniquet's on place. Okay. I'd indicate the time and any when I transfer, any, any, the next level of care that I transfer this patient to, I'm gonna make sure that they know that this tourniquet's on. Okay. It's my, my hand's starting to go numb there you now, go. so yeah. I know it's a good application. <laughs> <laughs> so for, right. for people that but that's the combat have... action tourniquet. So people, for people that don't have any, any background uh, in this, have never, like, I, I mean, I've messed with tourniquets before. I've, I've, I've experienced the, 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 the wonderfulness and, and, the, and, the, and the, the pain that they can provide. Uh, but placement, placement of the tourniquet, where, where, you know, compared to where the injury's at, where should they think about, hey, where do I place this tourniquet at? You know, two schools of thought on that. Okay. And again, neither one of them are wrong. Um, Tourniquets got a really bad rap early on in EMS. Is uh, they would tell EMTs in the beginning that if you put a tourniquet on a guy, man, they're going to have to cut his arm off. That's just no. It. I remember that I, when I when I first went through medical training in uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, they were actually completely against tourniquets. And then halfway through, they they that's when the thought process changed. Yeah. Well, we started. I mean, the science started coming out and saying that's just not that's simply not true. You start getting the areas of four four and a half hours of the tourniquet being on. Now we start running into limb problems. Uh, the, the, the question is, where would you place the tourniquet in relationship to the wound? Well, first of all, it's never placed directly over the wound. It's never placed over a joint or, you know, things like that. And, uh, and the school of thought is three to four inches away from the wound or as high as you can possibly go. Now, here's what I found. Uh, in my Blackwater days, in my Army days, I was dealing with some guys that hit the gym. They had some pipes on them. You know, they had some big guns on them. Uh, they were doing leg days and stuff like that. And especially when they were forward deployed, because we would have three a days for working out and everybody was getting huge. So if you take a guy that's got an arm that's this big and you're trying to take that tourniquet and compress all of that tissue hard enough to shut off the, the pipe, it really, really takes a lot. Hmm. Now, the human body's an amazing machine. And what the human body, what, what's happened here is we've taken our really important pipes the really big ones, brachials, femorals, and we've buried them deep in our body, except for in the axillaries, in the groin, and in the armpits. I mean, if you reach up here, you can feel your pulse inside there. You can find your pulse in there because that is laying close to the surface. So my success with tourniquet application, and I've applied hundreds of them in real world uh, scenarios, is that the higher I go, 
the closer the pipe is to the surface, the better shutdown I get on it. Okay. So just in a personal aspect of it, uh, again, pros and cons, and some people will argue four inches away, try the first tourniquet four inches away, and then if it doesn't work, then, then go as high as you can. Uh, the only problem with that th thought of process is you burn both of your tourniquets. And if you needed multiple tourniquets for multiple injuries, you've got two tourniquets on one patient. Uh, I personally go as high as I can. And I, and that's been the success for me. So, uh, so on that, but again, neither, either way is right. You can go that three to four inches away from the wound as, as long as you're not over a joint or over a broken bone or something like that. Okay. Um, I would recommend that you cut, I mean, there's no modesty in this medicine. I mean, make everyone naked. You know, that's one of the first things we do as medics is take those trauma shears and, and expose that wound. If guy's got magazines in his pockets and, and range books and, and the dope for his scope and all that stuff in there, then that's going to that's gonna interfere with the, with the function of the tourniquet. Got it. Got it. No, it's great stuff. Great stuff. Um, so getting back to the blowout kit, what else do you uh, carry within your kit other than the tourniquet? Okay, other than the tourniquet, I carry some type of pressure dressing. Yeah. This one in particular is the Israeli. Uh, it was funny because I was stationed in, I was working in Israel with Blackwater for a year and, uh, and, uh, I talked to the, uh, the IDF guys and they, and they, they laughed. They're like, we've never seen this. <laughs> so it's made in Israel and they ship it out. But the Israelis were like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a pressure dressing. And what it is, is it's basically, uh, stretchy like an ACE wrap. Um, the one thing that makes the, uh, the Israeli unique is what I call the boat cleat. You know, it looks like a, a cleat on your boat. And this is an anchor point for cinching it down. On the inside, you've got, uh, you've got where you're, this goes towards the side of the wound and it actually says it on there, other side towards wound. Uh, again, think about stress and, and the lowest common denominator, all that stuff's gonna, gonna add up on it. It's like a claymore, right? Front towards enemy. Uh, so, so this side towards the wound. Uh, the, the important thing with the pressure dressing is once you get it on, get it in place, and one of the things that we do in the training is you, you keep your, your choke up on it really close. So if I, was, if I had an arm right now and I was wrapping it, I would never let my hand get too far away. And I would keep yeah. continually taking, taking pressure. Now with the Israeli, what happens is you come back through. It's, it's hard to demo without an arm to do it on. Yeah. I would go back through the boat clamp, do a couple of wraps, and then I would reverse. And when I reverse, it takes this and pins it down and gives me a new man, uh, uh, mechanical advantage on that. And then you continue to wrap up. When you get to the end of it, it's got a nice, uh, a nice plastic uh, piece. It's got teeth on it, and that can be twisted and, and locked into place, and it gives you a good, a good placement on that. Uh, the Israeli uh, R&D on these things are always finding out new stuff. You see right here where it won't go down any further? Yep. Uh, all of this material will not keep going. And the Israeli, it's because they put a, a little cotton stitch in there to keep the whole thing under stress from unraveling. Nothing worse than going to get a, a pressure dressing and getting it out of the package, opening it up, and then the whole thing is eight feet of, of ace yeah. wrap on the ground. So with these, all you have to do is pop it, and it comes, and it comes free. Got so it. you see the, the stitch right there? Uh, on the North American version, the North American Rescue version, uh, they've just used Velcro. So they've got their side towards the uh, – so other side towards the, you know, towards the wound, yep. and then they've just got Velcro added. So each step you go down – you have Velcro instead of the cotton stitching. Now the North American Rescue doesn't uh, doesn't you have the boat cleat, and uh, and the current medical one of the medical directors that I'm working at on on another project uh, has found that this one um, he's gotten better results with this one simply because people have forgotten how to use the boat cleat about six months after training. So they, ah, they did a study okay. where they, so if you're not constant, uh, perishable skills, you know, yep. it's like side line and sight picture and trigger control. They're all perishable skills. And if you're not reinforcing it. So this is the North American rescue uh, one that, that, uh, that also is, a, is an effective pressure dressing. Okay. Can I make a pressure dressing out of a roll of curl X and an ACE wrap? Absolutely. You know, it's all about putting pressure on that wound and wrapping it. So tourniquet for extensive arterial bleeding, bright red, pumping blood with a great deal of pressure. Yep. Uh, anything other than that, you know, other wounds like that, you can go with a pressure dressing. You can go with a combination of anything. Uh, another thing that I would add is some type of hemostatic gauze. Yep. This, is a, this is quick clot. This is a quick clot trainer. Um, these run at about $25, $30 a pack. And what it is, is it's just, a, it's just gauze that's impregnated with a hemostatic agent, which causes clotting. So if I had a wound and I was going to pack a wound with it, uh, and the technique is rolling into a ball, pushing into the wound, and then just keep pushing the material in, 
this hemostatic agent is going to effectively stop the bleeding by, by the chemical reaction that it has. That's uh, exactly what I use with my guy when he uh, do you, you get, do you use your gauze? himself in the leg on there. Yep. Yeah, quick clot when it first came out got a really bad rap, and and everyone's like, oh, it burns you and it's crappy, and the trauma surgeons hated it because when it first came out, it was a big granulated powder. Yes, you would rip the pack and dump it in, and now the surgeons would have to debreed all that garbage out of there. Uh, some of you know, you'll appreciate this being a former Marine. But, you know, we did a bunch of training with a lot of the Marines prior to the invasion, and uh, these guys were uh, these guys would somebody would fall off of a Humvee and, and get some road rash on his on his butt. And his battle buddy would turn around and pour that quick clot on. And next thing you know, <laughs> his ass is on fire because of the thermogenic response. Well, that <laughs> thermogenic thing that happened with quick clot, they ended up getting rid of that. So, okay. so they kind of mitigated that out. So the next generation was tea bags versus the granulated powder. And then it's morphed into the combat gauze, which is a really effective item. Every blowout kit should have it. Got it. All right. So <laughs> pressure dressings, hemostatic agents. Uh, how about something for an airway issue? airway control. This okay. little flexible tube is called a nasal pharyngeal airway or NPA. Uh, nasal pharyngeal airway is its fancy medical term. What it ends up being called is the nose hose. Uh, what, the, what the nasal pharyngeal airway does is it slides down the nostril. Once you're trained on how to use it, it slides down the nostril. And what it does is it maintains an open passageway uh, for air to move in and out of the lungs. Every CPR class, every first aid training you've taken, they talk about the airway, 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 airway. Well, whenever I start a class, the first thing I ask the students is, what, is that, what the hell does that mean, airway? You tell me in the most simplest terms what it means. And what it is, is it's a pipe that starts here in your nose and mouth and runs down to where your lungs are. If that pipe is not open or blocked, we're not going to be getting the air in. I mean, I've been to scenes, uh, mass casualty scenes where there's been an explosion, and when you're doing the triage, sometimes you just have to do a jaw thrust maneuver and open up someone's airway and they will spontaneously start breathing. These are people that weren't breathing on their own simply because their airway was blocked and they were so out of it, they couldn't do it on their own. So just merely grabbing that, uh, grabbing the mandible and opening up the, the airway, they would, they would gasp out, you know, because they were, they were in, in need of it. But having a good pharyngeal, nasal pharyngeal airway, a nose hose in your kit, uh, usually the size is the 28 French. This is the, the one that's kind of the most common. You could probably go up to 30 if you got big dudes, stuff like that, but they make them, they're, they're absolutely huge. Okay. Uh, putting it all together, I mean, pressure dressings and tape and trauma shears. I mean, one of the kits that, that I particularly do, and I do some custom kits, is something like this version right here. Okay. Um, what I've done with this is um, I've put uh, two tourniquets, mollied them in, uh, two tourniquet holders and mollied them into the outside. So I've got two combat action tourniquets mollied into the outside. When I get into position here, all I have to do is pull this and the Velcro will pull it down and expose everything that I need. So I've got pressure dressings, trauma shears, tape, nasal pharyngeal airway. I've got all the equipment that I need handy. This is what I would have with me immediately. If I'm on the range, I'm out hunting, I'm, I'm doing something in the back country, this is my immediate go-to. Okay. It gives me lots of options and I can stop bleeding, keep an airway open, and I can treat, one of the things we haven't talked about is treating an open or sucking chest wound. Mm. Uh, having some type of uh, three-sided occlusive dressing or a commercially vented dressing like the Hyphen or the Asherman. Uh, but this is something like this, and with these kits, I, I make them custom. So I find out what the client, what the customer wants. Uh, usually when I'm teaching a class, people will go ahead and ask me about orders on stuff. And I go, you want an individual blowout kit, something like this? Do you want a full range bag? Do you want a truck kit? You know, so it's all about what you want. I got to be honest with you. Anytime you tack the word medical on stuff, the price automatically, you know, hits doubles and, you know, doubles in price. Yeah. Uh, just like tactical, you put that on something, it's, it's automatically. Um, I do this one in black, uh, desert tan and or the OD green that you see here. Nice. But just gives you something that you can go to immediately. And then with the molly on the back, you can go ahead and run it right through the belt. Okay. But, cool. uh, um, and then one of the things I haven't talked about that I would add other than that is some type of emergency space blanket. Okay. Um, right now there's huge research and development on, on thermal regulation, keeping people warm and, and uh, blood clotting, coagulopathy. So this is a huge, uh, huge thing. So even if it's 80 degrees out, uh, keep them warm, keep them warm. And if you've never had one of these space blankets on after a marathon or anything like this, these little Mylar ones, yep. 
man, they get you warm fast. You yep. know, you finish a Spartan race and they wrap you in this and you're like a baked potato. Uh, definitely something to have in your kit. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, <clears throat> so you guys, uh, something that, that uh, me and Robert were talking about before we got on here was um, something that could possibly benefit you guys with this, with the blowout kits uh, is Again, you guys can go out and get all of this material yourself and put your own kits together. Or I was talking to Robert about, you know, asking him, uh, you know, if he can put these kits together for you guys, uh, basically put together maybe a couple different packages that you guys may uh, be interested in, uh, as in like you're just a basic kit um, and then a little bit more of an advanced kit. Um, and then, you know, he can custom make these for you guys and then you guys can get everything you need, you know, straight from him. Um, so we'll be sending out a link for you guys later on, uh, probably this week, letting you guys know, Hey, if you're interested in this, reach out to us, let us know. Uh, and we, we can put together the kits for you. Or again, like you guys could take out all the knowledge that we just shared with you, put together your own kits, um, and be ready. So, yeah. And if you're coming out to the, uh, to the May training, if you're, if you're part of the, of what ghost ring is going to be doing in May, we're definitely going to be putting the, uh, it is May, right? I gotta uh, March and May. Yeah. So March, okay. March is full. May's, May's going to be the next, uh, the next okay. the only one that's open right now. The next one's open. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, that's something we're going to be incorporating into the training. Again, it's something that I'd like to get done and, and with Nick's approval, something yep. to be done on, you know, the first day. And then we can go ahead and just start throwing these medical scenarios in. But, uh, but having the blowout kits and having them available. So when you, and at least some type of training kit, uh, whenever you buy this gear, I recommend you buy two, you know, one to train with and, and, uh, and then one to keep in pristine condition. Your trainer can still, don't buy the trainers. First of all, the, the trainer items like that are usually twice as much money for a trainer. I have no idea why they paint it blue and they call it a trainer and it costs more, uh, buy, buy the actual item. You're going to open up all the tourniquets, but open up an Israeli, you know, it doesn't mean you can't use it. Nothing that we're doing in combat medicine or field medicine is sterile. I mean, we try to maintain some type of sterile field, but trust me, when you get to a hospital, they're going to load you up on broad spectrum antibiotics to kill any, any critters. Yeah. Um, having said that, we don't try to infect or make, you know, get the wound dirty, but, but if you don't have this equipment out and you're not practicing with it, you're not going to be proficient when, when crunch time comes. We all know that when people say that he'll arise to the occasion, that it, that is not what happens. You, you, you go to the, to the minimal to amount of training. training. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you guys, so again, just to, to recap, um, if you guys are interested in coming out uh, to the tactical camps, this is going to be a huge part uh, that we're adding into all of our camps. So we're going to be doing on day one, we're going to be doing, we're going to be going into a few hours of uh, just your, your, your basics. And then we're going to get more advanced from there, but we're going to be throwing scenarios at you where you're going to have to physically take care of these injuries throughout the four days. Okay. So it's not just one section that you're going to get some medical training in. We're going to give you some medical training up front, and then we're going to test you throughout the four days to see, hey, can you, can you handle this? Can you handle this under, under basically our stress, fake stress? Uh, because when you get in the real world situation, that's real stress. Okay. So we're going to see if you, if you can really handle that. Um, so again, wanted to throw that out there. If you guys are interested in coming out to the camps, uh, I'll send you guys all a link uh, to, for the May camp. Again, March camp is full. Uh, but if you guys want to come out to May, I think they're, after that it's September. Um, and then our next one, I can't even remember the dates. So, but again, next one's coming up is going to be, is going to be May and we're going to be covering all this stuff. All right. So um, if you guys have any questions uh, for Robert or myself, you guys can throw them into the chat box. Uh, we just had that, that one question so far. Um, if I don't see any questions pop up here soon, uh, we're going to end this thing. Uh, Robert, you got anything else for us? No, just thank you for coming out. I, I'm, I'm glad to be associated with Ghost Ring Tactical now. I think it's a, a good partnership. And, and, I, and guys, you know, it stresses one of those things when it comes to training that we really want to embrace. I'm sure you guys know that with whether it's your firearms, your hand-to-hand -hand, or defensive tactics, your E&E, your land navigation, and then adding the medical component in there. I've got a feeling after working with Nick a little bit uh, on, you know, just remotely now that I think we can, uh, we can get those stress levels up and you'll definitely have a, uh, an excellent training experience. Oh yeah. I, I, I'm good at stress levels. We're good at right. that. Yeah. And the suck causes them to bond. You know, once they embrace the suck, then that really causes them to bond. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's what brings people closer together. Right. All right, you guys. 
Um, so we don't have any more questions here. Again, if you guys have questions later on, you can always shoot me an email. Um, and yeah, if you guys are coming out to any of the May camps, again, we got some people jumped on here, be like, hey, I'm coming to November camp. Hey, I'm coming to May camp. Uh, you guys, this is what you should look forward to. Uh, it's going to be a great time. It's going to be uh, a great learning experience for you. And you will walk away from these camps with a ton of knowledge that's going to help keep you safe, keep your family safe, keep other people safe. So, all right, you guys, we will talk to you. See you next time. And uh, look out for those emails from me about the, uh, the links to the camps and uh, the link for the actual medical kits. All right, Robert, thanks for being right. here. Good night, guys. Right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.